This is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. Title IX, the federal law that prohibits gender-based discrimination in school programs that receive federal funding, turns 50 next month. That's June 2022. But how fairly is the law being applied, especially when it comes to girls' high school sports? That's the big question today's guest set out to answer as part of a reporting team of nearly two dozen student journalists from the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism and the Povich Center for Sports Journalism. Both are at the University of Maryland. With us today to represent that team is Karen Newhouse. She is a longtime education journalist, EWA member, and a fellow at the Howard Center. Kara, welcome to EWA Radio. Thanks, Emily. It's great to be here. For the past few years, you've been reporting for MindShift KQED, that's in San Francisco, but you were previously a local education reporter in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Did Title IX issues crop up on your beat? Oh, definitely. In this project, we saw a lot of examples of Title IX issues related to softball and baseball, and there actually were some parents of softball players at one of the districts I covered who talked to me about the disparities in their facilities. And at the time, I just honestly didn't really know how to cover it. It was an issue I I thought was important, but I I didn't have the vision for it, nor like the, it wasn't an editorial priority either. So I didn't end up writing about it at that time. But I think, you know, you've made a good point here, which is why it may not be a front burner issue for a lot of education journalists. There really is a big impact here for students in high schools with their access to activities like sports, especially young women. Right. Participation in sports and other extracurriculars can have a big impact on any student's engagement in school and as well as their own confidence and all these other aspects of life. And I know that was true for me as a student athlete. And I think there's one way in which this is an education topic, but it's also sports. And so it it maybe kind of gets ignored by both sets of reporters because it's at the intersection. I think that's a good point, too. You know, I want to talk about this national poll that was conducted by the Howard Center and the Povich Center. It found that three quarters of students and six out of 10 parents knew nothing about the law. Let's assume there's some lack of understanding among some of our audience. What exactly did Title IX require nearly 50 years ago? Title IX is a federal law that prohibits sex discrimination in all educational institutions that receive federal funding, which is the vast majority of educational institutions. And it does apply to pre-K through 12 and colleges and universities, even though we mostly hear about it in relation to colleges and universities. And it applies to all programs within those federally funded institutions. So even though the law itself, which is only 37 words, doesn't mention athletics, school sports and other extracurriculars are covered by Title IX. Are there any misconceptions about Title IX? Certainly, more than misconceptions, there's, as you mentioned, this lack of understanding and awareness of what Title IX is. But in sports, one big misconception that I've heard from schools and we saw in our reporting is that if certain facilities or resources for athletic teams are funded by booster clubs or outside donors, that that's not the school's responsibility for if those are for the boys and not the girls. But that is not true. Um, That is not an excuse that is acceptable under Title IX law. What were some of the other top line findings from this national poll? You know, because there was such a lack of knowledge about Title IX among most poll respondents, it was hard to glean a whole lot from the other answers. But I think one of the big takeaways from our reporting is that the burden of Title IX enforcement is really being left to young athletes and their families. Um, There's not a whole lot of proactive enforcement of the law. Um, So it it relies on, as I said, young athletes and parents to, to file complaints or even lawsuits. But in order to do that, you have to know that you have these rights under Title IX, and then the process and the poll really showed that most people don't know about the law or the ways that they can address Title IX violations. 
You know, what jumped out at me is that a third of people polled said they believe that equal opportunities exist in high school athletics across the U.S., but in their own schools, parents and students viewed things much more favorably. They said two-thirds said boys and girls had equal opportunities there. And that it reminded me how consistent that is with a lot of national polls, where people generally give their local schools higher grades than public education as a whole. Yeah, that was striking to me as well. And I think it shows how we take these issues for granted, especially when they're like just the norm that is right in front of us or that we experience every day. So if you're used to there being dugouts for the baseball fields and and benches for the softball fields, and you don't know that Title IX exists, that doesn't jump out to you as much as when there's a big thing like the NCAA locker uh, weight rooms in the March Madness tournaments last year. Your major contribution to the project was data mining and analysis, which anchors the rest of this project. You spent seven months looking at federal data on Title IX. That is quite an endeavor. Yeah, it actually started with Title IX advocates. So there's this um, federal data set called the Civil Rights Data Collection, which is covers a huge range of topics, not just sports. In fact, sports are just a few questions in this biennial survey. And we heard at the beginning of the project from some Title IX lawyers that they didn't trust it based on what they'd seen in cases they'd litigated. So I gathered sports participation data directly from school districts across Maryland and compared the two and found that, in fact, the numbers don't match federally versus district data. And through additional reporting, more traditional reporting, found that one of the big reasons for this is that the federal data collection asks schools to only count athletes who are on single sex teams. And so if, for example, there's a team of 100 football players, 99 of whom are boys and one of whom is a girl, none of those athletes get counted, which makes it look like there's fewer boys proportionately than there are and can overstate girls' participation in sports. Well, let's just make this crystal clear. I mean, it's important for the data itself to be accurate because you want them to have the correct numbers on what's happening out there. But there are other implications as well, aren't there? If the data isn't accurate, how is that hurting whether or not Title IX is properly enforced? The Office for Civil Rights, which is part of the U.S. Department of Education, is responsible for enforcing Title IX as well as other civil rights statutes. And they're the ones who collect this data. And if they don't have accurate numbers on who's participating in sports, they really just can't <laughs> properly enforce it. And also, they they have a public website with this data where they put the single-sex athletics numbers next to enrollment for every school and district. And so this information that the public should be able to access to see if their own schools are treating girls fairly also isn't accurate. I should say that the department, a Department of Ed spokesperson told me that the public shouldn't rely on that data alone to determine whether their school is in compliance and that they use that data in conjunction with several other factors to determine compliance. But it really just seems like, why do you collect it if it's not for the purpose of enforcement, which is is the stated purpose of, of that civil rights data collection. I want to emphasize here what a big deal this is, what you uncovered. You had some great descriptors in your story when you describe sharing this information with the people who are really paying close attention to Title IX and those numbers, and those are the advocates. And their reactions, they used words like flummoxed, perplexed. One person called it bizarre to exclude co-ed teams from the data. How are these data errors making their way into sort of this larger narrative around girls' sports, especially when reporters are writing about it? I think the larger narrative, especially you see this like when women are, U.S. women are raking in like gold medals during the Olympics and such, That is that Title IX is, is a story of victory at that Title IX was passed and the floodgates were opened and girls and women have had all these opportunities to participate in sports since then. And it's not false. Like the numbers of girls and women have soared since then. But if we only focus on the sheer volume, it obscures 
the obstacles that still exist to fair treatment and even participation. Because I found that if you look at federal data in in the schools I looked at, it suggests that at 40% of them, girls are actually overrepresented in sports relative to enrollment. But when I looked at district data, at every single district I looked at, girls are underrepresented in sports. They may not be as underrepresented as they were in in the 1970s, but they're still underrepresented. And I think we didn't dive into this, but some research has shown that also when you break that down by race, there's even stronger gaps for girls of color. You mentioned that you did get a response from the Department of Education, albeit one that was a little lackluster in that they said, well, people shouldn't trust these numbers or use them too heavily anyway. But but you get a sense, I mean, even just in advance of next month's anniversary, that there's any appetite to go back and make these more accurate? That's a great question. Uh, There is a chance that this focus on single-sex athletics will, will change in the next round of the civil rights data collection because there's been a proposed change to the question. It appears that that change is being driven by the need to count non-binary athletes, which is important. Um, And as a result, the whole way it's being asked is also changing. But I didn't get direct answers to about all of this, including what the reason for the change is, the proposed change is. And also, there actually, I went back through archives of old survey questions. And in the early 2000s is when this the language of single sex athletics got introduced. So there was at least one or two um, surveys before that where it wasn't. And I, I still no, don't know why it changed. So it, it's unclear why it's been this way. But it's been this way for at least 20 years. And that's really a missed opportunity to have good data to assess Title IX compliance. We're talking with education journalist Kara Newhouse about the 50th anniversary of Title IX and where the federal law is falling short in protecting high school girls' sports. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And thank you to everyone who has taken a moment to rate us on iTunes. Your support and your feedback are helping us to grow. Kara, you worked with a team of reporters tackling a wide range of angles on the story. I want to encourage everyone to go and read the full project. We'll put a link to it up on our site on EWA.org. I want to know, what are some of the areas where girls are still being discriminated against or not getting equal resources? Facilities are a big one. We had stories that we did report on and then other cases that we looked at but didn't necessarily appear about girls playing on dirt fields at a junior high or like a community park while boys play on turf on campus don't have to like travel um girls having not having locker room access and carrying their their equipment for sports around all day to and from their classes while again boys have you know very nice locker rooms also scheduling and this, you know, just reminds me of a lot of stories I've read f- from the 1970s, of, like women like Pat Summit writing about um, playing their teams, playing early games while the boys get the premier time slots. And that's still happening. Social media and, and, and publicity is another one. So publicity is supposed to be equal, but you'll see girls teams not really being their games, not really being advertised on school social media accounts or having cheerleaders at them while the boys do. Kara, before the break, you were talking about the fact that the pressure is really on the students and their families to know about this federal law and to demand that it be properly enforced. And one example of where the squeaky wheel gets the grease was in a story in the package about students in Vista, California, where two girls protested the lack of equitable facilities for their softball team, and the district ended up building them a new field. That story was from your colleague, Ashkan Modometti. I'm wondering, is there a story in this package that you'd especially want to point our listeners to? I love that story because it is um, it is a story of victory. Ultimately, the, the school improved. It was after the girls graduated, which you see a lot in stories of girls and women fighting for equal treatment in sports. But it's that one is very cool because it's a double education story. I think Title IX is an education law, but then that 
their advocacy came out of learning about Title IX in a civics class at Rancho Buena Vista High School. So it really shows how education on Title IX can empower, uh, in this case, girls to speak up and fight for their rights. We want to point people to the website where all the stories live for another reason, and that is you personally show your work to a remarkable degree here. There are supplemental links to the actual granular data. Why did you make the decision to do that? It's actually a practice that we do for every story with the Howard Center is publish our data fact check notebook. And the data fact check is just part of the overall very rigorous fact checking for all of our stories. And so what this fact check notebook shows is all of the code that I wrote for every single data driven sentence in my story. And so it also has more detail on the data sets I used, what their limitations were. And One of the reasons we do that is the ethical principle of transparency for journalists. Just as we expect that of government, uh, journalists also should be transparent. And because data work involves making a lot of ethical choices as well about related to the limitations of data, that's important to share. And then also, you know, because we are a nonprofit outlet, it's, I think, a good practice to share how we were doing this work so that other journalists can learn from it as well. Well, let's build on that. What do you hope they learn from this and what can local reporters take away and apply to their own work? First, I hope that local reporters like start to think about Title IX issues in sports as an education story and, and consider how um, at the 50th anniversary the, these issues may or may not be playing out in their communities. One tool that I would recommend education reporters look to is the Office for Civil Rights Resolutions database, which is a resource where, so when someone files a Title IX complaint or any other civil rights complaint related to schools with the federal government, they typically enter, the Office for Civil Rights typically enters a voluntary resolution with the school. And then they, once that agreement has been made, those documents get posted on OCR's website. I didn't know that existed when I was in Lancaster covering education. And so it's a great resource to look for leads on cases happening in your area. And that's actually how we started a lot of this reporting. I scraped all of the Title IX athletics related um, resolutions from that that site. And we did a review of all of them and talked about which ones were story worthy. But it's also limited in that, as I've said multiple times, the, you know, filing complaints relies on knowing, knowing about them. So I would recommend getting to know booster clubs and and parents and finding out what they're frustrated about in, in their young athletes lives. And then as far as participation, I would advise caution on using federal data. So I would recommend using public records requests to get data directly from school districts and compare that to enrollment. It's not a very complicated mathematical calculation to look at how many girls are in sports versus how many are enrolled in the school district. So I think even without the resources that we had, it or even the amount of time, if you're looking at a more limited number of schools, it is very doable for local reporters. We mentioned one of the hurdles you encountered, and that was getting answers from the Department of Education. I'm wondering, was there another roadblock that you successfully navigated? Once I figured out that the numbers definitely didn't match from the districts I was looking at to federal data, getting information from schools was pretty hard, not because they were not wanting to answer me. They just, my first forays into questioning. Um, They just mostly said, we don't know anything about the federal data, even though (laughs) they actually, schools are the ones that submit it to the federal government. So someone in their district had to have done something with it. Um, But I had to work through many layers of, okay, this is what it is. So it maybe it was the athletic director, maybe it was someone not related at all to athletics, because the rest of the questions aren't. And then walking them, like trying to find the person who might have filled it out and then also asking them 
because I didn't know like the single sex athletics part was one possibility, but I had, you know, 10 or 15 different things I was asking questions about to try and rule out other possible explanations. And so trying to walk them through and get that was, um, was challenging, but eventually like with most, most topics, I I found a few useful people who, kind of knew what I was talking about and and some who said, yeah, this process is really confusing. <laughs> you and I were talking before we started recording and we were kibitzing about the fact that we've been going back and forth on education stories going back a decade. You've been doing this a long time. What keeps you excited about education journalism? I mean, I still think it's the most important beat. <laughs> you know, all beats are important, but this is cheesy to say, but this is the future. The way we teach and raise our kids shapes everything about our country. So I think it really matters. So you're wrapping up a master's program in journalism at the University of Maryland. What's next for you? A big part of why I went into this graduate program is to really advance my data skills. And this project illustrates how I've been able to do that. And it's been really cool to especially use it for a a topic that's about education and gender inequity. So I want to keep doing this kind of work. That's, you know, accountability reporting, data driven, and looking at issues affecting kids and schools. Karen Newhouse is a longtime education journalist and a graduate student at the University of Maryland. You can find the full project, Unlevel Playing Fields, online at cnsmaryland.org slash title nine We'll also put the link up on our website. Kara, thank you again for making time for EWA Radio. Thank you. That wraps up another episode for us. If there is a story or a reporter you want to learn more about, drop us a line at radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For nearly 75 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, take good care of yourselves, and thank you for listening.